everybody. Welcome to our final speaker of this, our 25th year of the Glen Bard Parent Series. My name is Gilda Ross. I am the Glen Bard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. I am so glad you are here for this very important event. I like to think we have saved the best for last, and that's Jessica Leahy. In this, the 25th year, we invited back our favorites, and it just so happened that one of those favorites had a very important book coming out, and this is just the perfect time to talk about this book, to talk about her work, and to welcome her back to the Glenbar Parents Series. Thank you to all the sponsors who make these programs possible. We are welcoming some new coalitions tonight and going forward next year, the Deerfield Parent Network, the Parent Community Network, Link Together Coalition. Uh, you saw our, all of our usual sponsors. These are the annual sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you so very much. Next year, we will again be virtual. We felt that um, it's been a successful year. People have really responded to these virtual events. So we're gonna give it another year and then we'll evaluate at that time. But because we're going away for the next couple of months, we wanna keep you busy reading some of the important books that and the authors that we'll be showcasing next year. You can find this on our website at glenbargps.org and our Instagram, Facebook, this is a slide of some of the authors that we'll be showcasing, and it's, it's quite, a, quite a great lineup. So check out the books at the library or your local bookstore, Anderson's, or the bookshop in Glen Ellen, and come on back and spread the word. Everybody is always, always welcome. I'm so excited about the program tonight. Um, this is, as I said, one of my favorites. Jessica Leahy is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Gift of Failure, How the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed. It was a presentation based on that book that first brought Jessica to the Glenbar Parents Series in 2017. And we couldn't be more excited to welcome her back with this just released book, The Addiction Inoculation, Raising Healthy Kids in a Culture of Dependence. For over 20 years, she has taught every grade from six to 12 in both public and private schools and spent five years teaching in a drug and alcohol rehab for adolescents. She writes about education, parenting, and child welfare for the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Atlantic. She's a book critic for Air Mail and won the educational and wrote the educational curriculum for Amazon Kids award-winning show, The Stinky and Dirty Show. She co-hosts the uh, Am Writing podcast with best-selling authors KJ Delantonia and Serena Bowen from her house in Vermont, where she lives with her husband, two sons, and we just heard the dog, so we know the dogs are there too. We're delighted to welcome her back to GPS for this important event, which will be presented tonight and again tomorrow at 7 p at tomorrow at noon, 7 p.m. tonight at noon tomorrow. So please, on your social media, let everybody know that they need to come back um, at noon tomorrow and join us. And everybody is always welcome to Glenbar Parent Series free programming. Without further ado, Jessica, the program is yours. Yay! Hello, hello. I'm so happy to be back. And there are, um, everybody seems to be uh, interested in how Coco is doing. Um, my dog Coco uh, made the front page of a three page spread in People Magazine. And so literally more people talk to me about the fact that my dog was in People Magazine than the fact that I was on Pe in People Magazine. And there she is. She's down there. She's sleeping. The other two are in here with me too. So let's just hope the UPS truck doesn't come because that's what they love the most. Um, I am so excited to be back mainly because so I loved the gift of failure. I love that I had the opportunity to write the gift of failure. Um, it was you know, it was my first book. It's my baby. But this book, The Addiction Inoculation, was the book that I was born to write. This was the book that when my agent came to me and she said, well, I went to her with the proposal and I said, you know, I feel like this, this is it. This book, it took me, you know, four years to really figure out what I was going to write next. It came, I, I swear, it came like just it dropped in my lap with the title and everything. I had to pull off the highway and I texted my two best friends who are my co-hosts of the podcast, the I'm Writing Podcast. And I said, I've got it. And I sent the proposal to my agent and she said, look, Jess, this is great, but I have to warn you, addiction is a really hard space. I mean, you know, it can be depressing. It's scary. It's like, you know, you have to just thread the needle just right to make it work. And so one of the first people I talked to about it was uh, Peggy Ornstein, who makes a couple of other difficult conversations, boys and sex and girls and sex, a little more, 
I don't know, just more approachable. And so the the dance that I'm trying to do with this book is to, um, I wrote this book for my students. I wrote this book for my kids and here's why. So I'm an alcoholic. I have um, next month, it will be, um, Next month, it will be uh, eight years that I have. And uh, when I got sober in 2013, you know, I'd spent about a decade, um, a little almost a decade, really uh, spending most of my energy on how to how to protect my own right to drink, how to keep it from people, how to keep a secret. It was just, it was exhausting. So suddenly when I had more energy to focus on other things, suddenly I turned to look, think about my kids because I was raised by an alcoholic. One of my parents was also raised by an alcoholic and so on and so on and so on. And so suddenly I'm um, the first one to get into recovery um, to that point. Now, since then, actually a couple of others have gotten into recovery, which is like a win right there. But um, I was the first one to get into recovery. And um, I was just kind of curious about where this stops. Does this, can I make this stop with me? And uh, thank you for letting us post some of the answers that we're just about to hear from you. And Great. let's get started. Thank you so much. First up, we have Teresa. Take it away, Teresa. Hello, Hi, Teresa. My name is Teresa Gravel, and I'm a junior at Glenbar North High School. My question tonight is, with many mental health issues leading to substance abuse, how can we create a lifeline with other students to prevent them from turning to drugs? Yeah, I love, love, love this question because so much of what I talk about tends to be, you know, what parents and teachers can do um, about, um, about substances. There's a chapter in the book at the beginning of the talk, talk, I mentioned Brian and Georgia. Um, Brian is in a chapter about peers, um, about it's called Everyone's Doing It. And it's a chapter about peers and how we can sort of deal with the peer pressure stuff. And what's really interesting is that there's a, um, there's a, a bunch of studies that sort of very, in a very broad way, in a very black and white way also, say that, okay, peer group is one of the biggest risk factors for substance abuse. So if you hang out with other kids who do drugs, you are more likely to do drugs, which is a little bit, it's, that's a little bit too, um, it's a little too black and white for me because it turns out that the picture is a little more complicated than that because my son, Ben, uh, became friends with this kid, Brian. And Brian, again, that's his real name, fantastic kid. Brian um, got kicked out of high school, not one time, not two times, but three times for behavioral stuff and substance abuse, substance use. And uh, when I found out that my son Ben was friends with Brian, I freaked out, except not in front of him. I freaked out internally. And what I wanted to do was say, you are not allowed to be friends with that boy. And uh, that would have been a really bad thing because of course, uh, number one, they were in classes together. Number two, they hung out together and ran together and stuff like that. Um, so one of the best things that we can do when our someone we love is either um, starting to use drugs and alcohol or is hanging out with someone who is using drugs and alcohol is to talk even more about it. And from the parent perspective, what I did, and I'll get to the, your friend pers perspective in just a sec, but from the friend perspective, I said, or parent perspective, I said, Ben, you know what? This relationship with Brian is really freaking me out because I know that you being friends with Brian increases your risk of using drugs and alcohol. And we already know that that's a problem in this family. So in order to feel better, for me to feel better about your relationship with Brian, I, I, if it's okay with you, I'd like to talk about it from time to time because I just need to know where you are with this relationship. And we talked about it a lot and it ended up being a great way to start conversation. For Ben, Brian was having real issues. And so Ben had to do something really important, which was number one, to make really good boundaries. You as, uh, or I, we can't control other people's use, especially if they're starting to have problems with drugs and alcohol. Um, and we can't make that our job. Just like if a friend of yours is cutting herself or if a friend of yours is, is having suicidal ideation, we can't take that on ourselves to be responsible for that. It's gonna be really, really important that you um, push your friend to talk to someone about what's going on. And often with substances, what, um, there are a couple of reasons that people use drugs and alcohol, and some of sometimes it's just novelty, and sometimes it's just because they want to try something new, that kind of thing. But sometimes it's because they have something inside of them they're trying to fill, or they're trying to not feel. And what's one of the tough things, actually, in the rehab that I worked in is that once you take the drugs and alcohol away, you got to deal with some really hard emotions. And in the book, I talk about Georgia drinking to deal with her 
to deal with her anxiety. Other kids drink to do, you know, to deal with abuse they've experienced. And it's going to be really, really important that you encourage your friend to talk about, to talk to someone, whether that's a teacher, a counselor, someone they trust, a pastor, if they go to church, that kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing is going to be for you to remember that there's going to, there may come a time when you need to step back in order to keep yourself safe. And that was a point at which um, both George's friends finally had to realize that they couldn't prop her up and keep her going to school, that they they were sort of risking their own safety to, for her safety. And Ben had to realize at a certain point with Brian that all he could do was promise Brian that he would be there for him um, if he wanted to talk, but that he would not contribute um, in, to being a part of Brian's uh, rapid trajectory downward. And so um, at a certain point, his friends were really clear and they said, you know, we're going to be here for you um, as long as you're really trying to help yourself. But if you're not, then for our own sort of safety and boundaries, we're going to have to, we're going to have to protect ourselves as well. And in the end, the nice thing about that is in the end, Brian, after his third uh, um, expulsion, and thank goodness the school kept uh, to their to their consequences because if the school hadn't actually kicked him out that last time, he doesn't think that he would have actually understood the consequences of his actions. When he looked around and he saw that he was actually going to lose these people who had stuck with him the entire time, the people who had been loyal to him, the people who really believed in him, whereas his drug friends they skittered away really, really quickly as soon as the as soon as the hammer came down on Brian and and didn't really want much to do with him. Um, having those friends be with him and be loyal to him and yet having kept healthy boundaries, he said, was one of the things that he realized that was a turning point for him. He realized what he was about to lose. But for you, Teresa, I think the most important thing is to realize that you, and I, I know this is a general question, but that it's going to be really important to keep yourself safe and keep boundaries while still supporting the person that you care about so that they know that you're there, but that you're not going to rescue them at every turn. So that's going to be really, really important. But thank you for that question, because that's a really tough one. Oh, one last thing really quickly, since this often comes up, Thank um, you. helping someone with their substance use issues, think of it as like a 100 piece puzzle. For me, my dad was piece 100. The morning after my last drink, my last, it was ugly. It was bad. It was my mom's, it was at my mom's birthday party. It was bad. My dad came and sat on the end of the guest room bed and he looked at me and he said, um, I know what an alcoholic looks like, and you are an alcoholic. And for me, that was the last piece of my puzzle. I said, you're absolutely right, and I need to get help. But that piece wouldn't have been the last piece if the other 99 pieces weren't in place, because I knew long before that, and people had said stuff, and I had thought things, and things had gone wrong. But all of those things, I, the one through 99, those weren't the pieces, Number 100 was, and I've been piece 100 for people before, and that's amazing, but you're hardly ever going to be piece 100. You're probably going to be piece two or piece 57 or piece 72, but they'll never get to 100 if you're not there as piece one or piece 57 or piece 72. So don't be afraid to be piece 57 or 72 because those pieces are really, really important too. Okay. Good, very good. Sean, you are up next. Hi, my name is Sean Rath. I'm a junior at Glenbard West. And I know this past year has been very hard on students, but some things that people might not always think about is how adults have been affected. Yeah. So I was wondering how, as young people, we would be able to recognize and maybe help our parents or other adults in the community that might be struggling with substance abuse. I love your question so much. It's such a good question. It's a really empathetic question too. I really, I love it. Um, we know for a fact that adults have been drinking way more than usual during this pandemic. And hello, I, I don't get to escape from this. I'm 10 pounds heavier coming out of this pandemic than I was going in. So, you know, I've been compensating with something other than alcohol, but 
Um, so we know that adults are drinking a lot more than usual now. And, um, and what's been interesting is a lot of rules got loosened about like where alcohol could be served or if alcohol could be a takeout kind of thing. And so, and a lot of places are delivering alcohol like right to your house, right to your front door in ways that they weren't before because pre pandemic we had rules against that but they loosened those rules to make alcohol more available. So if you are worried that your parent, your brother or sister, um, has an issue with alcohol and I'm, I'm mostly thinking of older people since uh, people that are older than you uh, because that was where your question was um you know this is really scary as a kid i was the kid my sister and i used to trade back and forth who was the one who would bring up the fact that we were worried about our parent and it was really hard because we would get in trouble a lot um when we said that we thought there was a problem and it was really hard but we banded together and i think it made my sister and i stronger because we we were a unit against that other thing, which was the parent that didn't want to admit that they had a problem and the other parent who didn't, who wanted to pretend like there wasn't a problem either. Um, and the other thing that you can do without worry that you're, you know, going over some boundary is find a counselor to talk to. Um, school counselors today, you're really lucky in that school counselors today are actually people who have master's degree in counseling, whereas when I was in uh, school, you know, counselors didn't have to have quite those, those stringent uh, educational requirements. So the school counselors that you have access to and pastors and people in the community that can be really important allies for you as well. Um, and I know it can be really, really scary to talk about a parent's use, but again, I mentioned that 100 piece puzzle. Um, I would much rather be one of those pieces. There was one period and the, you know, I, I never talk about this stuff, but since you brought it up, I'll, I'll bring it up. When I brought up um, that my, once I was a little bit older, I think I was in college, I brought up my parents' alcoholism to them and I flushed that parent's uh, pills down the toilet and um, that parent didn't speak to me for two weeks and it was horrible, it was horrible. But it was one of those pieces in that parent's puzzle. And it probably was pretty early on, like piece 25, but I'd do it all again if I had to. Um, it was really, really, it was really difficult. And I think, again, the strength that I had in my sister, the strength I had actually in an aunt who was really supportive of me during that time and who believed me and um, the other people in my life who actually believed me and were willing to say that there was a problem going on and, um, and that they, would, they were there to talk to me. That was really, really helpful. Um, and I'm going to do some more thinking. There aren't a lot of great resources for younger people about the adults in their life. And, and if they have a problem, I'm going to have to do some looking. But Sean, I'm going to find some and I'll make sure that uh, Gilda has them on her list because there should be more of those. I'm going to look into that. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Lauren, you are up next. Hi, Hi Lauren. I'm Lauren McDougall and I'm a sophomore at Gunbarn West. And my question tonight is, you talk a lot about what brought you to like write this book, but I was wondering how you started that conversation with your kids. <laughs> yeah, that was scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, the pro so, so I got sober on June 7th, 2013. And my kids, uh, you know, I, I'd known for a long time that I had a problem and I had a lot of thinking about how I was going to talk about this. Like I kind of just wanted everyone to be okay with it right away. It was kind of like, you know, I'd had a lot of time to think about it. So I was cool with it. So now everyone should be happy that we're all cool with it. But it was like day one. And that, you know, the only thing that was going to get people to trust me about the fact that I'd had, I was going to get a handle on my drinking was time. And I just had to be patient with the people around me and let them have their feelings about it. In fact, a lot of things that are in this book um, people didn't know before this book came out, like my husband found things out when he read this book about like hiding my drinking and stuff like that, um, that he had no idea. And so reading this book was like a revelation to him. And I, I kind of just wanted to say, get over it. It was like years ago. I'm over it. Why can't you be over it? Um, but the first time I really talked about it with my kids was at dinner at a family dinner, actually. And we sat down and um, I told them uh, they already knew uh, we talked about um, the genetics in our family. We talked about the fact that they had a grandparent who had issues with drugs and alcohol. And that was something that um, had been stuff we'd had to experience together anyway. Uh, so we talked about that. And I talked about the fact that, um, that I'd been drinking too much and that it was time for me to just stop, that it was gonna be easier for me 
to not to be in control of my drinking if there wasn't any drinking in my life. And um, and that was a really hard discussion to have. And then over time, I started opening up to them more about what that meant for them. But I figured that amount of and, and that amount of information at the beginning was scary enough. So I unfolded the genetic stuff over time and in a way that was developmentally appropriate because my kids were pretty young when I got when I got sober, like ooh, like uh, nine eight or nine and like 14. So the 14 year old, I think was ready for information that the younger one wasn't ready for. But, but the part, the important part for me is that um, when I was little and I wasn't allowed to talk about it, uh, that was really upsetting because not only, I don't know if you know what gaslighting is, but when a kid comes to you and says, here's what I experienced. And the parent says, nope, that's not what you experienced. Your experience is incorrect. That is not actually what's happening. That's called gaslighting, making the person think maybe they're crazy. And that was what I experienced. And I knew that was the one thing I could never ever do to my kids. And that being as honest as possible from as early as possible was gonna be really, really important. So I have been um, extremely blunt and extremely honest with my kids from very, very early on as it was developmentally appropriate for them. So, yeah. I, I don't have time. I, we don't have time for euphemisms for, you know, for not talking about that elephant. That elephant is big and scary. And when it gets mad, it smashes everything in the house. And so we had to talk about it being there so that everyone could avoid it. Your mic, Gilda. Margaret, you're up next. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Margaret Corona and I'm a senior at Glumbard West. And I know Teresa con kind of had already asked a question about preventative mm -hmm. measures, but mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions for effective communication with a friend who is currently struggling with substance abuse? Yeah, so just being really honest with what you're seeing. And the other thing that's important, one of the things that um, I love to teach people about is the I statement. Like when you do this, it makes me feel that, or and, and having any conversation with someone about like, often it's a great way to, to approach something with your parents that you're afraid they're gonna get defensive or angry about. You can just say, mom, when you do this, it makes me feel this. And you know, what's she gonna do? Argue with how you feel. Um, and with your friend, it can be the same thing. You can, what's really important is to say things without judgment and with love and support and say, you know what, here's what I've seen. I've noticed, for example, I mentioned cutting too. So I've noticed that your hands are covered all the time and you never let us see your arms. And I'm just worried about that. Or I've noticed that your breath smells like alcohol at school and I'm, I'm scared for you. If you come at them from a place of concern and a place of, no, like I mentioned before, no judgment, that's gonna really help open up those lines of support. And then at a certain point, you have to make a decision about how much information you're willing to take on because again, you are not a therapist, you are not a counselor and taking on or feeling like maybe you can help fix someone um, is gonna be a dangerous place for you to be because we can't fix other people. We can only help them see the stuff that they need to fix and then help them as they go off to fix it themselves. So ju no judgment, support and love, what I observe, what I see, what I perceive and then let them respond to you in that way. Terrific, thank you. Patrick's, you're up next. Good evening. My name is Patrick Haji, and I'm a senior at Glenbard East. And I know you talk to a lot of students and they tell you things that they want their parents to know. So my question is, what do kids most often say that they wish their parents knew? <laughs> So I, uh, this came out because I told Gilda earlier that when I speak at schools, often what I do is I speak to the kids during the day. I talk to their teachers in the afternoon and do professional development. And then I talk to the parents in the evening. And so when I talk to the kids during the day, I give everyone my email address and it, it's hysterical because I ask them to email me and tell me what they would like me to tell their parents what do they want their parents to know that maybe their parents aren't hearing or they're afraid to say it or that they should just know and there's a couple of key things but by far by far the number one thing i hear from kids is i am not my brother i am not my sister i am not you when you were my age i am not your do-over I'm not some imaginary kid you think you're, you're raising. You don't know, see, hear, understand me. So to me, those are all iterations of the same thing, which is please see me. 
know what I care about, listen to me when I say something is important to me and don't dismiss it as not important or relevant or whatever. Um, and that's that at the, you know, when I talk to people about what I do for work and what my whole entire career has been about, it's about helping adults see, hear, know kids. And, and that's the one thing, if there's any gift I could give a kid, it would be making sure that the adults in their lives that care about them actually know who they are. Um, and we don't mean to do that. We really, really don't. We just, we just want to get it just right. And we screw up sometimes. So yeah, I make sure that parents know that right off the bat. Beautiful. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Our last student question, Naomi, go. Hi, my name is Naomi Friedman, and I'm a junior at Glenbard South. And my question is, what is the most important skill in drug abuse prevention for teenagers to take away from all of this? Self-advocacy. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of teaching kids self-advocacy from like, from the beginning. In fact, kindergarten teachers, when I interviewed kindergarten teachers and nursery school teachers for um, the gift of failure, and I said, what is, what, what do you want parents to know that their kids can do that they don't? think their kids can do they say basically everything they're like everything there's all this stuff their kids can do that they don't believe they can do and one of those big important things is to speak up for themselves and I think as a teacher one of my primary responsibilities is to help kids be heard and in order to help kids be heard we have to help them cultivate actually this is also a Julie Lithcott Haynes thing she and I talk about this all the time we have to help them figure out who they are cultivate that inner voice so that it's really strong so that when it's time for it to come out that outer voice can be as strong and as confident and as persuasive as possible so that you can go out in the world and tell people what you need and ask for help and give advice and be a good listener and do um, make sure that the things you need out there in the world um, come to you because you're able to advocate for yourself. And that's, you know, being heard is, is really the greatest gift that we can help kids uh, get to. Beautiful, beautiful, thank you. Last question, last comment. Stephanie Henry, social worker, Glenbard North, take it away. Yay, social workers! Hi there. <laughs> Let's see, is my mic on? Okay. Yep, you're good. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to say that I was so happy to hear you talk about on the preventative side about social emotional learning um, and how um, I, you know, having those programs really does help mm -hmm. to uh, prevent usage. And, um, and that last question was awesome and how she talked about self-advocacy being one of the primary skills. One of the questions that I had, and I was very interested, um, was with social emotional learning, and you talked about that health component mm -hmm. um, being more evidence-based. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious about this. Do you think that it would be advantageous for there to be a, like a, a home connection or a family connection between schools and families and the whole social emotional learning piece? That is such a great question. So I actually profile a couple of social emotional learning programs, well, substance abuse prevention programs, which are at their core, really good social emotional learning components or programs with the health component. Um, there's a couple of them that I'm just crazy about. And all of them have home components. All of them have things, um, as either assignments to talk to your parent about X, Y, Z. And if you don't have a parent to talk to, to find someone else to talk about it. And I talk about these in great depth um, in, in, that in the education chapter, chapter nine of the book, mm -hmm. because so many, um, so many parents tell me that they just feel like they need some backup on this. And it's not that they want the schools to do all the work. It's that they just need a starting place and these programs. And as I said, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. They exist and all we have to do is implement the good programs and not just any old crap program that's out there. Mm -hmm. And all of the ones that I evaluated for, um, for the book and that I refer to out, you know, that I don't get a chance to go into great depth on, all of them have home school components. So it's so important because if we're all on the same page, I mean, the reason that I love speaking at schools and talking to the kids and the teachers and the parents is that I get everyone using the same vocabulary so that we all know where we're talking about. And, and that's one of the most important places to start. It, yeah, and it also improves homeschool connection. And all of these programs come in different languages and there are ways to do it that are accessible. Um, you know, if you're, if you're blind or deaf, there's all kinds of accessibility options for most of these programs. So yes. Awesome. Thank, Thank you for that great question.
Well, <sighs> I'm all excited. I love doing stuff. See how pink my cheeks are. I get so excited talking about this stuff. Beautiful. I love it. Beautiful. Love this stuff. Thank you so much. The passion, the wisdom comes through. Thank you. Thank you. The coolest thing about this is that we've got we've got all of the tools at our disposal and evidence is just pouring in and we're getting much better at knowing what works and what doesn't work. And, uh, and I think we're only gonna get better at this. And the good news is that for the past 10 years, we know that substance use among kids has been, had been going down for about a decade. Um, it started to level out just before COVID started. So, you know, there's reasons to be optimistic and I'm really, I, I'm a perpetual optimist, but on this stuff, I really think there are reasons to be hopeful. It's so important to be optimistic, isn't it, all of us? So the good news is that we're going to get to hear this again tomorrow at noon. <laughs> and those of you that are listening, get on your social media if that is something that you do and tell everybody that you know that they need to join us at noon tomorrow and go to gladbargps.org for the link. Students, thank you so much. Thank Steph you, students. Thank you so you. much. Everybody, uh, we get out your reading list, read those books, join us in August when we start up again, have a safe summer, and thank you for the support, everyone. Take care. Bye, thank everyone. You. Oh, let's go to some questions. Uh, first up, Brittany, take it away. Hi, I'm Britt Hansen. I'm the social worker at Glenbard South High School. Yay, um, social workers and school counselors. Yay. Oh, okay, so you're, okay. there's a whole section about you in the book because um, okay. I, and I didn't have time for it today, but some of the most amazing, useful allies we have are our children's health care providers, um, school nurses, School counselors who, by the way, are not the guidance counselors of 40 years ago. These are people with master's degrees and have right. access to resources in the community that you may not even know exist. And yeah. social workers in school are, I so wish, we didn't even, where I taught middle school, we didn't even have a school counselor, let alone a social worker. So yay that there is a social worker. And, um, and I'll just say, David Larson, woohoo for having social workers in your school district. <laughs> <laughs> so um well i just want to take credit for that i need i need a pat <laughs> on the back I need a bad pat on the back, so thank you we'll give you lots of credit for it dr larson um so common questions that we get from parents um all the time about uh mental health substance mm -hmm. abuse, substance abuse resources are where can i get help for my student mm -hmm. and so yeah. we work really hard to know our community um, and make sure that we're aware of the hospitalization programs, inpatient and outpatient, um, aware of the uh, different agencies and organizations that specifically work with and support students who are struggling with substance abuse. We have contacts. Um, we have a really good program called Rosecrans in Illinois, and um, we have contacts that we can just reach out to him on his cell directly and say, Hey, Matt, I have this student who's really, really struggling. Uh, can we have a conversation? Can I give the parent uh, your direct cell? He's like, yes, absolutely. So really, I think sometimes the schools are the first uh, point of contact that parents think to reach out to. So we have to be prepared to provide the resources to them that make sense to them. And of course, you know, there's insurance and all kinds of different things that come into play, but there are resources in Illinois for families who maybe don't have insurance or it's not covered under their insurance. And a lot of programs will take Medicaid as well. So um, that's the biggest question that comes my way is how can I, how can I help my student mm -hmm. who is struggling with addiction? We see in the schools that it starts with vaping a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of education with uh, parents and we do a lot of education with teachers on vaping and um, how that's, you know, one of the kind of a gateway kind of a situation, like they're starting to make maybe uh, a tinker with, <laughs> with different things. Um, and so whenever a student is caught with a vape, there is a consequence, but there's also a, like a restorative uh, 
conversation, but also a, a mental health conversation as well. That's, been, that's fantastic. Actually, I talked last night about there's a chapter, the peers chapter um, features a kid named Brian. And I thank that school over and over and over again, because it was his expulsion that caused him to really look and say, and give him that moment of clarity that caused, and it was, by the way, it was a third expulsion, but thank goodness the school held its ground and didn't say, oh, well, we'll just give you another shot, um, despite the pressure from his parents, because that moment was a breakthrough moment for him. And he is now well, not because necessarily of, you know, these, you know, it, there were a lot of factors, but it was definitely that moment of, wow, I really am being held to consequences that not only helped him, but was a great example to his friends who um, were watching him go through that journey, which, you know, was a really important thing. And I also wanted to say, one of the things that's really great about social workers is, and important to know, about local resources is that for better or for worse, treatment of adolescents is shifting to a more community-based model rather than an inpatient model, which is one of the reasons I got fired. Um, so for example, in Vermont, there is no inpatient, like send your kid away. And some kids do need this, but there, um, you're gonna hear more for parents, you're gonna hear acronyms like IOP and places like that, which are community-based treatment um, offer, offerings that often social workers and, and school counselors can direct you towards. And because sending kids away isn't an option as much anymore, community organizations have had to come up with local options for helping kids um, when, they're, when they admit that they need some help. Yep, so exactly. thank you for all you do. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Ava, you are up next. Hello, I'm Ava Blaylark. I'm also a school social worker at Glenbard East High School. Yay. <laughs> I'm such a fan. I'm such a fan. <laughs> I was really um, excited to hear you talk about the prevention. And one of the first mm -hmm. things you said with prevention was um, good social and emotional learning programs, right. um, which we are all about in our district um, and are really, we've been pushing it, but mm -hmm. definitely a big push for next school year with, uh, you know, mm -hmm everything that's been going on. And so hearing you talk about those programs that also might need like a health component to kind of address some yes. of the things that you were talking about. Absolutely. Um, what if like your chosen program doesn't necessarily have a health component? Kind of yeah. what would you suggest for that? So in the book, I do profile a couple of them very specifically, ones that have been really highlighted. And when I say that have been highlighted, I'm not talking about because they're doing, they're doing their own research on themselves. They've been objectively third party um, evaluated by an organization called Blueprints out of University of Colorado at Boulder that looks at all kinds of programs, including like, you know, counseling for kids going, whose parents are going through divorce and separation or, you know, all kinds of different programs. And some of those are substance abuse prevention programs. And so if you go, if you Google blueprints, it's also in the book, um, you can look up the programs that have been rated as having evidence of, of efficacy um, from an outside um, evaluator. If your school is using, and I, I explain things to look for as well in the program, because maybe maybe they just haven't been evaluated yet, but I give you what um, in, in the book, in this, the education chapter, chapter nine, it's like, here's what good elementary school substance use prevention programs should include. Here's middle school, middle grades, middle school, high school, all that kind of stuff so that you can see exactly what's there. And the nice thing is maybe you don't have to throw away the baby with the bathwater. Maybe you can just say, oh, we're really missing this aspect of it that appears to be important. But on the other hand, there are programs that exist that we know work that are really quality SEL programs with the substance uh, use prevention. And again, that also have these homeschool components Components, which are so so great because most parents as and I know this for a fact most parents feel so helpless not even knowing where to start to talk about this stuff like how do you teach refusal skills how do you teach this thing called inoculation messaging how do you you know what is the data I don't know the data on you know how many kids are vaping this week um, but all of that information is constantly updated through those programs so that parents have access to that information and that's really helpful so 
either you look to just see what's missing in your program and see if your program stacks up, look to see if it's if it's been independently evaluated and given a gold star or whatever it is that they give. And they actually don't just say yes or no. There are ones that say sort of like looks promising. And then there are ones that say, no, 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 this one doesn't just look promising. It is good. And we've given it our gold star stamp of approval, whatever. Um, so you can compare those things. You can... Um, you can request uh, bits and pieces of those uh, curricula in order to sort of look at them and see how they stand up to your programming. Um, so there are lots of different things. And you know the, the programs that I mentioned in the book specifically also have um, customer service people that you can talk to. And actually they were really helpful for me. I, you know, I would call and ask, why is this part of the program? Why did you include this? And why didn't you include that? And they offered, you know, obviously their, their bias is to sell you their product. But at the same time, we also, speaking of selling the product and since David Larson is listening, um, there's in the education chapter, I very specifically uh, draw, uh, explain you know, some of the programs can be on the expensive side, but when you look at the amount of money that is saved over the long term by doing this prevention, it is so important. And those are arguments I specifically included those because they make for their own really good arguments at school board meetings because <laughs> you're going to have to come up with evidence. So I wanted people to be able to go to school board meetings um, with the most evidence available to them uh, for, for good programs, for, for putting their money behind good programs. Jordan, take it away. Hi, Jessica. Thank you uh, for speaking to us. I could listen to you all day. I became a first time mom in July. So <gasps> congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. You. Can I, if you, will you um, send me your information through Gilda and I'll send you a copy of Gift of Failure and the new book as a, as a oh, baby present. Yay. Congratulations thank you, to you. Thank you so much. I want you to move in with me actually. Because <laughs> <laughs> I feel the like dogs would be sad. <laughs> you can bring them. Um, okay. But I, I also run our county's prevention coalition, prevention mm -hmm. leadership team. We work on substance use prevention, uh, specifically for youth 18 years and younger. And, mm -hmm. and in the past year, we really put a focus on the mental health piece because right. we know that about half of individuals who experience a mental health issue right. will also experience a co-occurring substance use issue. Right. It goes vice versa, hand in hand. And so, for parents who are listening, sometimes that's referred to as dual diagnosis. So, you know, and actually what's funny is when I say that there's no places to send a kid inpatient in Vermont, that's not entirely true. There is one place, but they only do dual diagnosis. So they often, and in fact, in the book, I cover this because the first person I ever drank with um, as an adolescent, like to get drunk, um, she ended up having bipolar disorder and that bipolar is a huge risk factor. Anxiety is a huge risk factor. So those mental health conditions, and by the way, she died of alcoholic liver disease um, in her early forties. So dealing, diagnosing early intervention for all of that stuff is so important. So thank you for being a part of that effort. Yeah. And, and I, I bring that up because this past year, year and a half, there's been a lot of environmental factors that could contribute to somebody's impact on their mental health, especially our youth. Yeah. So um, between COVID-19 and the social isolation that kind of came from that, because we had to do that for the health and safety of everybody else and the cancel culture that's out there and social media factors, the insurrection at the Capitol and the political yep. divide. I mean, there's so many external environmental factors that our kids are, are soaking up that parents have no control over. Um, I'm wondering how impactful is that? How worried do we have mm -hmm. to be? And how can parents best counter those environmental yeah. factors that our kids are exposed to? Thank you. That's a fantastic question. And um, so when COVID first started, a bunch of us parenting educators, a lot of them have spoken at Glenbard. Um, I'm, to name a few, there's, oh, Katie Hurley, Michelle Borba, Madeline Levine, uh, Julie Lithcott Hames, uh, Christine Carter, all of these educators, we came together and we're like, okay, what can we do? We were looking at a summer, the first summer when their camps were canceled and everyone was going to be stuck and it was going to be a nightmare. What can we do to help? So we created this thing called Parenting in Place Masterclass. And um, for example, Katie Hurley and uh, Madeline Levine and a couple of the other people involved are actively seeing cl their clinicians. And so Katie Hurley was coming back to us and explaining like, look, we're seeing, I'm seeing skyrocketing um, anxiety, skyrocketing depression and suicidal ideation. I mean, we did see it's just, it's been a nightmare. Plus we know that adult drinking went up during that mm -hmm. alcohol consumption went way up during the pandemic as well. A study came out the other day, a survey came out the other day saying that one in six parents let their kids drink during the pandemic. Um, 
I mean, don't even get me started on that. So the most important thing, what we were relaying, given that we know this information, given that people like Katie and Michelle or Madeline um, were seeing this in their practices, Oh, and Tina Payne Bryson and a bunch of just wonderful people. Um, one of the things that we started doing was I've been recommending a couple of books. Um, sort of the um, anything sort of positive psychology reframing. Um, there's a book Katie Hurley actually wrote this year called A Year of Positive Thinking for Teens. And I've been using it myself, <laughs> believe it or not. So like every single day, there's just a way to reframe things. And, you know, and I think you've had Lisa Damore before. Lisa talks about this in, um, in her book, Under Pressure, how to help kids reframe what, you know, when kids say, I'm so stressed out, I'm so stressed out, helping them understand that not all stress is bad stress. Some stress is stress that can help move us forward as people. And then, so really the book I've been shoving into everyone's hands this year is Michelle Borba's new book, Thrivers, because what Michelle has done over her entire career is she's been sort of tracking kids who had really horrible stuff happen to them. And that includes pandemic. I mean, this is unprecedented, right? And usually when we talk about the research about how kids remain resilient coming out of, um, out of stuff like this, we have to look at like the Great Depression and stuff like that. Um, Michelle looked at all of that research of what actually helps kids not just survive something like COVID, but thrive afterward. And this book is invaluable. I can tell you that reframing, keeping kids involved in the in keeping the house moving forward. And what I mean by that is household duties. Uh, I don't call them chores, I call them household duties. This is gift of failure stuff. There's research that has shown that when kids feel like they are actually participating in keeping the house moving forward, that they're, they're, they're pitching in. They are a part of the engine of the family and that the family depends on them as much as they depend on the family, that their mental health tends to be better coming out of a crisis, whether that's the death of a family member or something like COVID. So that's really important too. To making, helping the kids be useful, helping the kids have a sense of self-efficacy. I can't, I mean, you know, there's a reason there's an entire gigantic textbook on self-efficacy by Alfred Albert Bandura. Um, that's really important. I do talk in the book about um, mindfulness practices. And for some kids, that's a bust. And some kids, it's not. But one of the things we know about both mental illness and um and anxiety and depression and substance use is a lack of integration in the brain between the sort of higher level stuff and the lower level stuff. And Dan Siegel really does an incredible job with that in AWARE. I talk about it in my book as well. The one last thing I wanna put before we go, I wanna make sure I recommend three books because the question always comes up, what do I do if I all, uh, Jordan, did I get to everything? Yeah, were? thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. The three books I wanna make sure I hold up before we go are, because the question always comes up. I am an expert in prevention now. I'm not an expert in, in intervention and treatment. I'm hoping to be someday, but I'm not there yet. And there are a lot of people in the recovery community, unfortunately, who are very willing to put themselves out there on as experts on topics that they are not experts in. And so I refuse to do that. So one, I, one thing I would like to do is if you are worried that someone you love has an issue, first of all, go to either the Partnership to End Addiction or SAMHSA, S-A-M-H-S-A. -S -S Both of them have um, toll-free 24 seven hotlines where they can refer you for help. If you, if it's not an emergency, emergency, you can read this book. Joseph, uh, Dr. Joseph Lee, he is actually the head of adolescent services at Hazleton, at Hazleton Betty Ford in Minnesota. And this book is really about, you know, from the moment you realize maybe something's going on to the point, you know, that your kid really needs to be in treatment and how to support them through that. I love this book. And then you can tell how much I love this book <laughs> because it's in pieces. It's, I, it's broken apart in pieces. This is David Chef's Clean. David Chef is the father of Nick Chef, who was the beautiful boy in the book and the movie Beautiful Boy. David wrote this book clean. This section here that I ripped out, this is the prevention part. And this section here is the intervention and treatment part. The book clean is a really great resource. And then finally, for young adults themselves, also by David and Nick Chef. The book high it is aimed at young adults it is in the language that i think you know young adults might appreciate so a little trick parents if you buy this book do not hand it to your child and say i would really like for you to read this book that gets your parents stink all over the book don't do that 
buy this book with this technicolor cover and put it out somewhere. I don't know, in the car, in the bathroom, in the wherever kids might just happen to run across it and pick it up. And don't say a word about it. Just let it be out there. And eventually they will pick it up and look at it, but not if you tell them to. So do not tell them to read it, just put it out there. The one book that um, I wanted my children to read more than any book I raved about from the time they were born, told them you must read A Wrinkle in Time, you must re read A Wrinkle in Time. And guess what book, they are huge readers, guess what book they both refuse to read? A Wrinkle in Time. Parents stink, it is a powerful thing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jessica, wise, passionate, generous. We've gone far beyond our allotted time. Um, I want to thank you for this wisdom again and uh, your promotion. You just saved me some time um, because we have Katie Hurley coming on December 1st. Yeah, she's the best. I love her so much. She's coming back. She's the best. Uh, Julie, like Hop Haynes, is coming back in February. Lisa Demore is coming in September. We <laughs> posted uh, Michelle Borba. Look, go to YouTube, our, our YouTube for some, um, some information from that we recorded with her. Um, thank you, Dr. Larson. It was so great to have you here. And Ava, Britt, Jordan, thank you. Thank you so, so much for having me. And um, if anyone's interested, just one last thing in a signed book, because some people are, and that's great. Um, two local bookstores here in Vermont um, are, I go there a couple times a week and I personalize books and then they ship them out and they're right there on my website at jessicalahey.com. So if you wanted to get a book signed for someone or for yourself, Easy peasy. I'm uh, I'm out there a lot doing it, and I'm happy to do it. I love personalizing books for people. Wonderful. And I know I know you support Anderson's Bookshop in Naperville, the bookstore in Glen Ellen. They've got your books on hand. Go get the book and take a look at all the summer reading. And we'll hope can't wait to have you back. Have a those are some great summer reading selections. Really, really good ones. I love those books. Good, good. good. Thanks, Dr. Larson. Take us home. Hey, thanks. Thanks. Uh, excellent presentation. And thanks, Gilda and the team. Way to go. Uh, get outside and enjoy some sunshine.